Hey y'all, it's Jamie with Out of Bounds with Jamie and Abby. For this episode, we have the amazing Dee Patel on um, talking about the Hermitage Hotel um, and how her career started 20 years ago. I mean, being 41 and um, such an amazing woman advocate um, for Nashville and how they redid the Hermitage. I'm just, I'm blown away. And thank you, Abby, so much for bringing her on and introducing us. I, I mean, I literally wanted to keep talking. And I know. We she's amazing. For a while. I know. I had breakfast <laughs> with her a, like probably a couple months ago and I was like, she has to be our next guest because um, just everything she's doing for Nashville and then the history of the Hermit- Hermitage Hotel, which I'm not sure a lot of people know. Yeah, I did so, it. Yeah. So anyway, listen to the episode. We hope you guys love it and enjoy Dee Patel. I feel like I'm a little bored tonight. I feel like I could use some fun. I will take over the city, yeah, baby. For my lead, everybody get ready. All my girls are with me tonight. Let's turn it up now. For this episode of Out of Bounds with Jamie and Abby, we are with the wonderful Dee Patel, who is Yay. the managing director at the Hermitage Hotel, and we're so excited to talk to you. I just feel like before we actually met, I heard your name a hundred times. Everyone's like, do you know Dee? Do you know Dee? Do you? I'm like, no. Oh, I don't know I'm like, I know who she is, but I don't know her. So then we had coffee, and I was like, you have to come on the podcast. So here we I are. Love it. Gosh, thanks for having me. Uh, yes. I'm so excited to get to know you. I mean, we've been here, I mean, for five minutes now, and I can already tell we're going to have a lot of fun today. Totally. I uh, can't wait. And we're at Drusy and Dar, and it's beautiful. We recorded our December podcast here with Clark Byard, and it was under construction, so it's really fun to, like, come back and do it again. I know. So. You see this face all fully finished. It's amazing. It's beautiful. I mean, literally, we got out of my car at Valet, and we turned, and the pink hermit was right there. And I'm like, oh, no, we cannot go down there until we go we to the go, pink hermit. Yeah. Okay, so Dee, tell us about your childhood and where you're from and how you got here. Yeah, absolutely. So I was brought up in England, Coventry, which is north of London, and born and raised. So moving to the United States was really interesting. So our family had a summer vacation in the mid-90s, and we traveled to a lot of different states. And... One evening, there was a, a big family get together and, and, and everyone was talking about us potentially moving to the United States. Maybe it would be wonderful, bigger, better opportunities for the kids. And so I'm put on the spot and asked, why don't you stay here for a year wow. and attend high school and get to explore the culture and in and, and a different community? And I thought, gosh, surely they're joking. So I said, as the gracious young Indian girl that that I was, still am, but was. <laughs> um, sure, sounds like a great wow. idea. And well, that idea was was taken pretty seriously, and I found myself in Vicksburg, Mississippi, with a family I barely knew, going to school. I'm 14, wow. ninth grade. I don't know what a pep rally is, or <laughs> wow, um, all the different terminology yes. that That's scary and I sounded different looked different oh my it gosh. was very foreign very interesting was it like a host family kind of like a foreign exchange student type of program no I probably shouldn't have said that they are related to us okay but not a family okay. that I actually yes. spent a great deal of time right. with. I met them once and they were lovely but you know you're you're plucked out of England yes. and dropped into Mississippi which is a completely different yeah, culture yeah. altogether. I'm from South Louisiana, so I get it. Yeah, <laughs> I get yes. it. My mom's from New Zealand, so she moved from New Zealand to South Louisiana. So whenever we were talking about your history and trying to learn a little bit about you, and Abby told me that you were in England and went to Mississippi, I was like, oh, that's very similar to my mom. And yes. a culture shock. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so I completed a year, went back to England. That took another year to work through the visa process. My dad was born in Africa, later moved to England, still Indian, but that took a whole nother year. And we moved back to Mississippi, this time in South Haven, which is right outside of Memphis, and then to Pearl, Mississippi, where I finished my year and a half. So four wow. high schools, four years. That was quite the roller so, coaster. Wow, I bet. So wait, you were with the your like family you didn't know that well for a year, but then you you said your the rest of your family came over or no? This was the same. So once we all relocated here, we all moved okay. together, and my parents were sort of traveling and trying to 
really figure out where they wanted to settle down in terms of just looking at businesses, looking at jobs. Mm -hmm. And, and so we were with family at that time as well. But, you know, it was, it was great. I will say that today I feel very rounded by lots of exposure to, you know, different cultures, different backgrounds, different experiences, mm -hmm. working through those adversity, you know, mm -hmm. moments. It teaches you a lot. It teaches yeah. you a lot. Well, That's and being amazing. without your parents, I'm sure for that time period was just like, I can't imagine at 14. No. That's a, that's such, such like a vulnerable age anyway. Yeah. yeah. So don't ask me what books I read and what my <laughs> curriculum might have been. <laughs> I can't imagine Bailey next year being going away, going to New Zealand, uh -huh. you know, and staying with my family there. I just, I have a 13 year old now and I, I just can't imagine that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she could. Yeah. That's amazing. I love yeah. this story. So, so then what brought you to Nashville? So I came to Nashville. At this point, I'd graduated, moved to South Carolina, finished school. I was working at the Jefferson Hotel in Richmond, Virginia, which is our sister property. I'm, I think, 2021, 20, was asked if I would be part of the opening team of the Hermitage Hotel. And I thought, uh, yes, that is a phenomenal opportunity for a 20-year-old kid right. to get exposure into. And so... That was really my first experience, even in Nashville, I'd never been to Tennessee and fell in love with the hotel. I had no intention to move to Nashville. We, I went back to Richmond, Virginia, came back and forth several times. Mm -hmm. And the general manager at the time said, pulls me aside and he said, Dee, what is it going to take for you to move to Nashville? And this is me sitting in my room one night, take out a sheet of paper, pros and cons. Yep. <laughs> what does it mean to move to Nashville? I don't know anyone. I don't know this property. This is very new. I'm in Virginia. I have friends. We are, I'm getting a little established. I'm getting my footing in my position there. And I really thought about it and I thought, gosh, this could be a great opportunity because there would be a lot more effort and work and learning to be had in terms of development. Mm -hmm. And so I went to my boss at the time, or not even my boss at the time. And I said, Greg, listen to me, hear me out. But I would love the opportunity to move to Nashville, if you would consider letting me over to your housekeeping department. And he said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you want to do what? And he said, I would love for you to oversee guest services and the front of the house. And, and I said, I've done that. And I, I need to know Good the heart of the hotel. Oh, that's yes. amazing. Not the most glamorous job, but it's the most important job. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and he agreed. And, and so that's what brought me to Nashville mm -hmm. wow. as I was overseeing the housekeeping department. I love that. I love and that you did that. Yeah. I You know, I think you've got to really understand kind of the foundational right. aspects of the industry that you're in. Right. Mm -hmm. To really get to enjoy be fulfilled be able to be a leader and to, mm -hmm. to fully understand the business and right. that's an important aspect to a property absolutely and what comes with that is also respecting those employees and understanding what they do in the nuts and bolts of i mean they're they're like how do you put it the soul mm -hmm. absolutely. the soul of the team that's right you know? That's amazing. So in a hotel, we call the, the department's heart of the house. So uh -huh. engineering, housekeeping, because these are the employees that are working in the background. There's so much effort that goes into a luxury property for mm -hmm. the guests to feel that they're having an effortless experience. Mm -hmm. And it's an important piece of it. And our teams are so socioeconomically diverse. Mm -hmm. They're multicultural people from different parts of the, the world with different backgrounds and traditions. And to me... That's so important. Growing Absolutely. up in England, you're in a melting pot. So much exposure I got growing up as a kid, different religions, celebrations, mm -hmm. cultures, ways that people come together as a family right. or as a community. And that's not as available in the South. You don't see that, you know, multicultural mm -hmm. community as much. And so I really enjoy it. I really enjoy that because I have a true love for the culture of humanities. I love that. And that's an important piece of it because I grew up in that space and yeah. was required to learn about all the different traditions and the celebrations. And that was really weaved into my childhood growing mm -hmm. up. Yeah, that's amazing. I so how long that. were you managing that department? 
I was managing directly for about a year or two and then just progressed into different leadership roles and eventually still had oversight, but my oversight continued to further expand as I further developed into my role and and into leadership to eventually overseeing all aspects of the day-to-day hotel Mm -hmm. operations and then today beyond that. That's That's amazing. amazing. Isn't she impressive? I know. (laughs) I can't wait to learn more about this hotel. I mean, we've been here for six years now, but I, you told me more in the past couple of days right? Well, and about I, the history. I want to clarify. So when you said the opening, this was under the new ownership, right? That's correct. Because this hotel has been, or what year did the Hermitage Hotel officially open? So we officially opened in 1910. Okay. And the family that I work for purchased this property in 2002, closed it, fully renovated it, restored it. It was really in a very poor dilapidated condition at the time that we bought it in the 2000s and really just bought life into the space but life at a different level of investment and the investment was really at that luxury five-star level that Nashville and its area really hadn't seen Mm -hmm. and and I wanted to be part of that and and that's really the the part of the industry I love so much is that you have this high touch space and you're able to really go above and beyond in a way that is so anticipatory, so unique, so special, and be able to be creative and, and be able to give your team the empowerment mm-hmm. to to do so much more than just work within the box. And so I love the, just the name of your, your podcast, Aww. Out of Bounds. I love working <laughs> Out of Bounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go into the history yeah. of the hotel because I don't, like I know the messaging has been out there, but still people I run into don't know. And I think it's so cool. Like one of the coolest parts of Nashville. It really is. Yeah. It really is. So when I started at the hotel, of course, there were lots of parts of history that were weaved into storytelling and how the hotel was described. And the suffrage movement, which I'll explain in a moment, was there, but not really there from my perspective. Mm-hmm. I didn't fully understand the depth of the history and didn't fully appreciate it at the time until we were leading you know, a few years up to the centennial anniversary. So this hotel was built in 1910, Nashville's first million dollar hotel. When you walk in, you know you're at a special place. It was a place to gather. In fact, one of the first phrases that were coined back at its opening was, meet me at the Hermitage. And that's what people did. It was a place of celebration. It was a place to be. It was a place to be seen. Architecturally, Beaux Art architecture is considered to be a masterpiece. Fast forward to leading up to 2020, We were embarking upon a national celebration, a celebration that celebrated women's right to vote. Mm -hmm. Well, Nashville and Tennessee became that final 36th state that was needed to ratify the 19th Amendment, which at the time, in 1920 and even prior, men were only able to have a seat at the table to vote. Mm -hmm. Women did not have that that right. Mm -hmm. And so it was a 72-year-long fight to get to this point. You had 48 states at the time, 36 needed to, to vote yes and be in favor. We were down to 35. Tennessee became that final pivotal state. Mm-hmm. And so this hotel became the headquartered hotel for the suffrage movement, wow. both the pro-suffragists, the anti-suffragist. And to think that there were women at that time that were not in support mm-hmm. of equal voting yeah. rights was also quite shocking to me, yeah. but perhaps maybe not too surprising. And so... We really got further, deeper into the history and learned so much and learned of how impactful our state was in passing the vote, but that Nashville was and this hotel was. Mm -hmm. And that story and that rich history really got the attention of our senators and so many that this hotel was designated as a national historic landmark. I love that. The last historic landmark was a Ryman wow. Auditorium. Wow. Oh, wow. And, and to get a distinction of that caliber, of, of that prestige, you have to have made a significant impact in mm-hmm. our nation's history, mm-hmm. a positive significant impact. And so that to me just gives me chill You're bumps saying. to know Absolutely. that the spaces that we're in, the restaurant that we're in, the walls that you are surrounded by, imagine if they could talk mm-hmm. and oh. what, what you could 
you know. I also love oh. the flower lapels story. Like That's right. The colors. Will you talk about that? I would. So the movement also became known as a war of roses. And so if you wore a yellow rose on your lapel, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you were in favor of the vote. If you wore a red, that distinguished that you were not in favor of the vote. So that's how they all knew who was where. And so you had the wow. anti-suffragists that were lobbying hard to overturn those legislators who were voting pro. There was a lot of colluding, spying, legislators getting drunk off of whiskey um, on the eighth (laughs) floor of this hotel (laughs) so that the anti-suffragists could sway their vote. Oh, Um, wow. And we are in prohibition. So, right. It was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of colorfulness that was happening during that time. And wow. it really boiled down. You've got the state capitol located next to us. Mm-hmm. You had the leader looking outside of her room. I mean, you didn't have the technology that you have today. But these were women that were campaigning hard to to, to really, you know, fight for their right for right. equality. And they did it through cookbooks. They would write recipes within cookbooks mm-hmm. that would have subliminal messaging in them no that way. would say, these are the reasons why it's important for women to have a right at the, 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 to vote mm-hmm. and the right to be part of making good legislative decisions, such as mm-hmm. pasteurization of milk, how schools are operating, yes. how meals are being served. There were so many things that were taken for granted and not fully understood that these books were used as part of that campaign. And on the flip side, the wow. anti-group that was not in favor would depict these women as masculine mm-hmm. monsters that they were stripping the right of their their husband and the man of you know going out to vote and and perhaps he might have to babysit that night or take oh, care of the Lord. family or wow. perhaps cook that right. night yeah so there was a lot of this campaigning that was centered around why it was the worst decision for a, a woman to have a right at the table mm-hmm. it makes me like when you you're talking about that cookbook like imagine being that woman the, the person who decided, hey, I think this is a good idea. Imagine how afraid she was. Mm-hmm. What if I get found out? You know, what if somebody rats me out? You know, I just, I cannot imagine being a woman at that time. I know. It was tough. And there was a lot of tough history centered around it. But for us, it was celebrating today. Mm-hmm. Right. We can't change the past and the history. But no. what we can do is celebrate today and, and beyond. Right. And to, f- to know that this hotel has such representation of of so much history besides the suffrage movement, but particularly that, that really resonates with a lot of, yeah. not just women today, but young girls. Mm-hmm. And so we worked with the Girl Scouts of Middle Tennessee and um, awesome. you know, my kids got folded into the history so that they better understood yeah. right. because I felt slightly embarrassed and, and also frustrated that this part of history really wasn't folded into our education as much. Mm-hmm. And there were so many people who didn't know. Yeah. If you knew you had some connection to the suffrage movement, if you knew you were either a historian or just knew it because of some connection, but the average person didn't really recognize the importance. I right. I mm-hmm. didn't know until two days ago mm-hmm. about this hotel and what it actually means to Tennessee Mm -hmm. and it's I couldn't wait for this yeah Yeah. I know well and then you guys wrapping the yellow rose into the design of your uniforms and stuff is really cool too I love that we did you know 2020 was a tough year as Mm -hmm. we all know and we started off with a really robust programming ideas of how we were going to celebrate but celebrate in different ways different ways to connect with different people, different yeah. generations, different backgrounds, different interest. And so we really tried to fold in the yellow rose and try to tell the story in ways that were modernized in ways that were really historical and would resonate mm-hmm. with those who really appreciated history. And so you have in the lobby this beautiful exhibit that speaks to it and you can read about it and appreciate it. Or you can have a cocktail through our suffrage cocktail menu, which took every key suffrage leader and we described this person by three adjectives. Wow. And then we created a cocktail that was built around the adjectives. And then on the back of the, the menu described each leader and their That's impact amazing. and their and a little bit about them. That's amazing. And that really connected to a younger generation because yeah. they felt, oh, I can order a cocktail by an adjective that resonates with me. And yet it was a way to educate, not just on the hotel's history, but history of our nation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yellow Rose Tea was another 
beautiful experience that we created that in 2020 was socially distant. It was safe. We could serve in a manner that was, again, really being thoughtful about the guest experience, knowing that we were all in a really difficult, awkward mm-hmm. time with the pandemic. But we had the 19th Amendment that was the, the, the front of your menu. You had it wrapped in this beautiful yellow fabric. You were gifted with a yellow rose at the, wow. the time of the conclusion of your your tea. You, we had an Iranian actor that played Ann Dallas Dudley, who was a Tennessee suffragist who really just touched the table for maybe 20, 30 seconds and to told you a little bit about it, enough to just inspire you. And that was really the goal was how can we program our activities and offerings to really be inspirational and, mm-hmm. and to take a bit more of a deeper dive into connecting our hotel and our city to, to history, but creating fun experiences around That's that. so amazing. How long did it take y'all to come up with these ideas? So we had been working on it the year prior. And okay. so the ideas we had were much grander and bigger. But as we got closer into February, March, April, oh, it's not happening. None yeah. of these things are happening that we had to really kick into gear and think very quickly of how we were going to celebrate and still make that beautiful noise that we needed to make at a time in which our entire world was at a halt. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't see myself not being part of a positive initiative, a positive celebration. And why would we let a global pandemic completely stop a celebration, s- stop like, the yeah. celebration, ignore it. Just mm-hmm. we, we couldn't let it disappear. Another hundred years weren't going to come in my lifetime. Right. Right. And so how are we going to author this chapter? How are we going to connect with our partners in the community? How are we going to work with all the different organizations where that we're also trying to celebrate? And Mm -hmm. we did it. We were able to make a way to connect with the community and beyond through storytelling, Mm -hmm. through different programming initiatives. And it was probably one of the most proudest moments of my entire career. Absolutely. Um, Especially as a first female managing director of a hundred and twelve year old hotel. That That is absolutely incredible. Thank you. I mean, so impressive. It had to have been such an accomplishment. And like, what were you thinking when they named you that? Like, what was your reaction? So I was a first general manager, female as well, prior to being managing director. It was really a very proud moment. That was probably six years ago. And then to be a managing director was really, really, I I was just really proud. I was proud that I could share that with my children because I want them to be inspired and and have that positive influence. But it wasn't until the year of the celebration that I, I, I just, it was a different feeling altogether. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have been more proud. I couldn't have been more humbled. Yeah. And to share that with a team and to get the team to be excited about that. And that. we have men and women in leadership. This is not a, a place that we just serve women. We serve right. mm-hmm. all guests. We're Switzerland. Right. But, <laughs> you know, it was just so great to get everyone folded into the celebration and just all be so proud of, of the things that we were about to accomplish and that we had accomplished. Well, and had you not been in that leadership role, like as a female, I'm not I mean, maybe the team wouldn't have put as much behind it. You know, you just never know what would have turned out. So congrats to you. you. I know. I feel so blessed to get to know you right now Mm because such a huge accomplishment. I know. Like I, I'm a stay at home mom. You know, (laughs) this is my first job in like, I don't know how many years. (laughs) So I always go back and like the both of you, you have had an amazing career And listening to your story, it just blows my mind. And I see it back and I'm like, gosh, I mean, I know what my job is, an amazing job, like my kids. Yeah. But I just, I don't know. It's so impressive. I never would have thought. You, you also know? have a husband who works so much that you yeah. support. Like, yeah, but like still. more than, you know, you're not just a stay at home <laughs> mom. Let's not right. say that. But it's, it's, it just it blows my mind like one of one of my girlfriends she's a partner for one of the music agencies here and i i pick her brain all the time i just i love it you know we we always talk about how like just a stay-at-home mom which you say a lot and i always correct you You because i'm like 
the the whole point of having the right to vote it, 102 years ago was that you can choose, right? Right. Like you can work. You can have these True. amazing careers. Or you can choose to stay home with your kids. And that yes. is honestly the reason I'm not a stay-at-home mom is because I don't want to be with my kids that much. <laughs> <laughs> Young. So I would prefer <laughs> to work and see them at night. You know what was so funny? So I, for Taylor's 16th birthday, instead of doing a big party, her and one of her best friends, they asked me and the mom, you know, can we just go to New York? Can that be our party instead? So the four of us went to New York. And we went to the New York Fashion Museum, and they had a display. Y'all, it was stunning. But it went from... I don't know, say the 1800s. And it had what the women wore Mm -hmm. all the way up until present day, right? And I just, I love 1950s. I love the clothes. I love that. I think that's why I love this so much. Because wouldn't you say this is like a 1950s art deco deco type of? Yeah, a little bit. A little, little, like hints. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Modern. So anyway, I'm looking at the 1950s clothes and I was like, Taylor, that's me. That's me. And she goes, Mom, don't say that. And I went, what? I like the dress. <laughs> and she's like, Mom, no, don't say that. Now, you're not a 1950s lady. You mm-hmm. know? And I'm like, well, I, didn't, I didn't mean it like that. Yeah. I, just, I want that dress. Well, it's funny you said that because the other day I was somewhere and a lady brought up that when she started working in her career, and she wasn't that old, they had to wear dresses. They could not no wear kidding. pants. And I just thought... Gosh, I feel so removed from that. I don't even think about it until we talk about the history and how far we've come. And Mm -hmm. I and I love that you're keeping that alive, because like we said, our kids don't know that. Absolutely not. And it's so important to show how far we've come as women. It's so true. I couldn't agree with you more. And you talked about pants. I had a tiny moment in my, right when I started in my career, where the uniform for my job at the time, I was 19 was a jacket and a skirt and pants were not an option at the Mm -hmm. time and i just thought in heels i'm sure yes and i just thought (laughs) yes and i hate pantyhose Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) who likes them really (laughs) they're coming back ladies i'm just telling you be aware can't can't do it (laughs) and and so i had about a year of that in that and it was like these really horrible polyester uniforms and, and moving to Nashville and under the leadership that I was under, it was really nice because we removed the pantyhose and we, you know, allowed the women to wear a, as they please in a business professional mm-hmm. attire. But it wasn't that long ago. Right. You really think about it. I mean, it touched my part of my right. career. Yeah. And people... It, it, they're watching right now they don't see what you have on your feet like you're in this gorgeous <laughs> suit but you have tennis shoes on I do and I love that <laughs> like I just I love that we're not expected to wear heels anymore and that's part of our our fashion and mm-hmm. I love it yeah I, love it. I do too although I do love my heels <laughs> I do too that's why your feet hurt that's why my feet are always <laughs> <laughs> you're so right <laughs> Well, so what other things did you face in like a more male dominated industry? What did I not face? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's been it's been very interesting. It's been lots of different hurdles, small and big. And and I think when I first started in the industry, it was very hierarchical and you sort of just sort of stayed in your lane and and yet there were moments where I would be in a staff meeting and I wasn't a a senior leader at the time and I would blurt out an opinion Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't realize until after I left the meeting that someone would say, did you just say that? That's amazing. You said that no one would ever have the, the guts to say something like that. And it, and at times like it would get me to think, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Should I not? And and really questioned. And the more I did it, I just... It, it became just who I, who I was, mm-hmm. who I, I am. That. And as I furthered my, my leadership within the industry, there were often times that I would be assumed that I was the executive assistant. Mm. I was a sales oh. person or in marketing because surely I would not and could not be the general manager. This was several years ago. I was in New York. Remember this. We're headed from one hotel to another, headed to the St. Regis. And we're, you know, it's a celebratory uh, event of all luxury hotels. I might have been 
one or two of 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 my you know female GMs that were present. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sitting in the car. There's this guy next to me, a couple in the front, and he says, "Oh, where are you from? What do you do?" And here's my mistake, and I don't do that so much today, but I said, "Oh, I'm I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm with the Hermitage Hotel." And he said, "Oh, okay, great. So are you are you sales or is your oh husband my here?" Stop. Um, Stop. And I said, "No, I'm actually the managing director." of the Hermitage Hotel <gasps> and, and he says, Oh, I'm so sorry. And and I said, you know, it's not the first time that surely people just don't assume that a young female could potentially be in a yeah. position of that of that caliber. And he just felt really this small he needed yeah. to. I bet he doesn't do that again. No. Mm-hmm. I bet he needed to. If you don't mind me asking, I mean, I know we always say you can't ask a woman's age, but you are quite young for this position. How old are you? I'm about to turn 41. Oh. <laughs> but she, we didn't get into her college, but, but you graduated like super early, right? I did. You I graduated did. at 19 with my bachelor's. Um, Johnson and Wales, at right? Johnson and Wales. Okay. Uh, partially because I started school one year early in England. We started school oh, a, a year okay. early. And then I was able to accelerate through taking summer classes and taking wow. additional courses as long as I kept a certain GPA that I was able to finish my bachelor's in about three years. Mm-hmm. And how did you know that this is what you wanted to do? How did you know you wanted to go to the hotel industry? And a little bit of background about me. I'm from South Louisiana, really teeny tiny, small town, Cajun community, oil field community. We did not have the hotels like you see in Nashville and big cities. I never knew that this was an actual career mm-hmm. until John took me out of Louisiana, you know, right. um, and I I saw that. I think it would be such a fantastic career mm-hmm. and so much fun. How did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Honestly, I didn't. No? <laughs> no. I was 16, 17 going into college and really still, America was still foreign to me and the hospitality industry growing up in England wasn't as prevalent. I mean, I, I that wasn't a, a thought for me. I thought business, perhaps something in finance and moving to, to, to the country here, my parents were surrounded by lots of family and friends who are really in the hospitality industry and encouraged that I explore it as a great avenue, but more on the corporate real estate side and less on the day-to-day operations. Uh And so I went to Johnson & Wales, which specializes in tourism and hospitality and culinary and started working at a hotel in Charleston and thought, okay, if I start getting my, you know, feet wet and just explore these different positions, I'll at least get a sense of the culture of what it means to work within a hotel, particularly if I'm going to be more on the corporate side and the Mm -hmm. real estate side. Mm -hmm. And I just continued pursuing that until I got to Richmond and started really getting into the operations and management. And and then moving to Nashville, it just seemed that my career just continued to grow and develop. And I was just able to move up and... A lot of it had to do with I knew no one in Nashville. I was single. I had no life. (laughs) So I worked every single day Mm -hmm. for months and months and months. (laughs) And my boss would be like, I am going to write you up for not like (laughs) taking taking a day off. off. Yeah. But But this was my world. And I just felt that if I could just put in and pour in a hundred percent every single day, knowing that I didn't need to balance it out with anything else that I could continue being that student. It was an, an extension of my education mm-hmm. that I needed to get into the real world, really get into every position, learn it and, and really become an expert at it. Quite often people will work in a position for a year and want to yeah. be promoted because of the time that they've been in, but not really due to the results they've driven. I right. love that. It, it's, it's two like, different things. Yes. It's almost like it's expected. If you're in a position for X amount of years, you're expected to move up and it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not. Well, and it's rare because you've been with this company 20 years, right? It's been about 20 years. So I feel like that's like very rare these days that you stay with a company that long. 
So, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with, I feel very fulfilled, Mm -hmm. not being complacent. Mm -hmm. And when you're working at an independent company, you don't have the corporate layers and you have to author all day long, every day, the next chapter, the next year, your strategic plan. You're very empowered to be very entrepreneurial. In fact, you have to be entrepreneurial to be in an independent setting like this. And to me, I thrive on that because it takes that grit and that hustle and you can really step outside the boundary to explore things that are different and unique and to me that's exciting I I couldn't work at a corporately structured property I I wouldn't have the flexibility to do the things that I can do today you wouldn't want to yeah do the same thing every day would be hard I bet it would be I would love for you to talk to my 16 year old (laughs) (laughs) She's trying to figure out what she wants to do forever. She wanted to do medical. And just recently, she's like, you know what? I don't think I want to do that, mom. I'm not sure what I want to do. I want to open up and and figure it out. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? I always joke. And I'm like, well, why don't you be an Amy Wells and, you know, be sports reporting? Yeah, that sounds interesting, but I still want to figure it out, you know? So I would love for you to talk to her. I would love to talk to her. <laughs> but it's so it's hard. 16 is hard. 17 is hard. 20 is hard. Yeah. You just don't know what you want no. until, you know, much further in your career. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when Let I grow up. <laughs> Do y'all want to know what I graduated in? <laughs> Fine, you. Love in our pond. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's what I graduated in. Oh, my God. <laughs> I always said, so ironic. I mean, really, I'm spilling the beans a little bit. I did not graduate college. I went to Nickel State, and I did. I fell in love with my sorority, and I did all things sorority. And then I started working, and I was very independent. And I told my parents, I'm like, I'm moving out. I want to move out. We lived 45 minutes away from the college, and that drive was brutal. And I'm like, what if I find an apartment that I can afford? And my parents were like, no, absolutely not. I know what you're going to do. You're going to go and party, which I did. (laughs) (laughs) And (laughs) so what I did is I got two jobs. I got a job with school. And then I I did. I I was a bartender where I met John. And I did my two jobs. And I did my school. Well, my school went down the drain. It really did. And so it got to the point that John and I were dating, decided to get married, He was always going to be in coaching. We knew that. So we're like, well, wherever we're going to be, there is going to be a college. So I had planned to go back to school. And I never did. And I I ended up having babies and becoming a stay-at-home mom, which I love. Going back to Nichols, I never knew what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I never really gave myself the opportunity to figure it out. I had said I wanted to be a school teacher. And honestly, I wanted to be a school teacher so that way I could have summers off with my children. I always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. It was just... So you always, did know. I did know. <laughs> I did know. I always, I've always said that. But then with teaching, once I started with, in school with it, I was like, you know what? I don't, I just, mm-hmm. nothing clicked. I and know. I think if you have a passion at such a young age and you know, then it'll give you the momentum and the drive to stay in school and forget about the fraternity parties. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have to study before you go to the fraternity parties, you know, it's just, it's impressive. Yeah. It's impressive. I would love for the three of us to sit here and, and, and talk about what we would have done at 20 years or what would you have done differently? Yeah. I think for me, well, I feel like these decisions start when you graduate high school. It's like, you feel this pressure. I have to know what I want to do because this is what I'm going to major in in college. And then my major in college is going to dictate the rest of my life. A, I would say your major doesn't necessarily dictate your life. You know, you, you can pivot and everything. And so I think if you're unsure and you don't know what you want, do a general degree, you know, do a business degree, do marketing. I did accounting because I, I don't know, in college, I was always like, I'm going to have my own business. I don't know what it's going to be, but that's what I'm going to do. So I did accounting. I'm like, every business needs accounting. And then I worked at a bank and in the middle of the recession, I told my dad, like the 2008, 2009 recession, I said, I'm going to quit because I want to do my own business. And he freaked out. But I did it. he did. I know. He's like, (laughs) can't you just like, we just got you through school and all this stuff. And were you married at that point? Not yet. We were engaged. So I was was like 24, 25 when I quit. Mm -hmm. Because for me, I was like, all I can do is fail and go back to that job. Like yeah. that that's the worst case scenario is that I fail on my own and I and I go back and that was 11 years ago. And so I think I would tell my 20-year-old self like 
follow your instinct, do what you want to do, trust your gut, but like also you can mess up. You're young. Yeah. You have nobody depending on you at 20. So true. Right? When like, you're 20, you think you're so old. I know. I know. <laughs> you're not. You're not. <laughs> so I think just try everything. See what sticks. Yeah. I yeah. love that. What about you, D? Yeah, gosh. I, I don't think I would have changed anything because I think that if I had, I wouldn't be here today and I wouldn't have learned I all the things and have gone through the different hurdles and mm-hmm. the successes and mm-hmm. even the obstacles because all the obstacles they all have a learning lesson. Yes. They, they teach you something, either to be stronger or to to learn from your mistakes. I would say to my 20, 21-year, 20-year-old, you know, just really trust your gut yeah. and, and just go with it. Do the best you can and make those mistakes. They're, they're going to happen. And, and the best you can do is make sure that you learn from yeah. them. And you're only going to get better and better. And here's an example of that. When I first moved to Nashville, I was in a leadership position at the age of 22. Mm-hmm. And that's gosh. hard. That's mm-hmm. really oh hard. Gosh. And and to get the respect of those around you who are either a couple of decades older or right at your level oh. was really difficult. But I, I was I, I was on this trajectory of just continuing to move up because that that was my path. That was my goal. That was my passion. And I remember one day, one of the managers pulls me aside and and he says, I want to just share something with you. There's a rumor. It's going around. I just want you to hear it from me. Obviously, it's not true because it's a rumor that I'm climbing the ladder and I'm being promoted because clearly I have some relationship with the manager that's promoting oh, me. Gosh. Oh, Lord. And I fell apart. I like, bet. I was devastated because I'd never experienced anything like that. I thought it was the worst thing that had, like my life had just been shattered. Uh. I mean, really over probably like today, I will say that was a little too dramatic. All mm-hmm. like, that is going to happen. Suck it up, cupcake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and just keep moving on. And And so I take that as an example of I was in my young 20s and I was devastated. I I couldn't believe someone would say something so appalling, so untrue, and that they couldn't see that I was doing my job really well. Yeah. And that I deserved (laughs) success. Mm -hmm. And, And so I took the advice of this manager that was... 20, 30 years older than me. So, you know, someone I really admired and looked up to. Yeah. And he said, it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's a rumor. Yeah. It's right. not true. You know, yeah. it's not true. Mm-hmm. You can't let these outside influences that are negative that are not here to support you or to be positive or there's, you know, could be someone that's jealous or not. It, there's lots of reasons why people say things that are not true. And I will never forget that even today and in the future as yeah. things things come up people say things mm-hmm. and you just know that well okay great yeah yeah good for you you know yes the truth and prevails mm-hmm. yeah it does but that was that was a tough time when yeah. you're, in your 20, 20 years old yeah geez that is hard for me i mean i had just met john at 20 i was still going to school and i, I don't know i'm a really big believer in things happen for a reason Mm -hmm. and really big believer that god puts you in a place where you're supposed to be and not to question things it's hard for me obviously because i did it a lot this podcast that i i do question myself but i also have to remember this is the way it was supposed to be Mm -hmm. you know and i have no regrets none i love that no regrets i love it yay (laughs) i love it too (laughs) Okay, so let's end on like all the changes being made to the Hermit Hotel. I want to talk about Drusy and Dar, the Pink Hermit, and then you guys have an upcoming renovation of the rooms. We correct? do. Okay. We do. So let's do that because we want everyone to come visit and see how beautiful. I this want everyone place to is. come visit yes. too because I love the things that we've done and the room that we're sitting in is so beautiful. Uh-huh. And to think that this room is 112 years old and it looks so chic and oh, so it's beautiful, just gorgeous. Okay, so pandemic we had to really pivot just like everyone else we had as a company with with our ownership it really talked about future plans for the hotel sort of its next chapter its next era the modernization of our spaces the redesign we were really maintaining the integrity of the designer of the 2003 the, mm-hmm. the last you know 17 years and we knew that it was time for us to make that next change and so the pandemic gave us the opportunity the silver lining of 
this horrible time in, in our world was a silver lining for us to fast track all the things that we had talked about doing in, in the hotel. And that was a redesign. We didn't know how much we were going to be able to take on. We didn't understand how long the pandemic was going to go on. Mm-hmm. But what we knew was this was a time to start making that change. And so we started with all of our public areas. We lightened the tone. We went from dark jewel tones to softer, lighter, brighter. We went from big patterns to textures and yes. just really softened the space. And as we were doing that through the public spaces, we knew that we wanted to completely overhaul our kitchen. We had already been speaking about Chef John George, who is this global, not just a global chef, a restauranteur, a visionary, this amazing man that's created this brand. And his restaurants span, you know, Milan, Tokyo, London, New York, of course, Beverly Hills, just beautiful cities. Mm -hmm. And the idea of him potentially partnering with us in Nashville became just a deeper conversation we all had. And so we finally solidified that partnership that summer. We were still in the center of celebrating the suffrage anniversary and the history But that year needed to be centered on the historical celebration while we were planning on the next chapter. And so we started building the team out. We built out the design team, the architectural team, the local team that were going to support us. Now, mind you, we're doing all of this via Zoom, which was um, (laughs) hard. No stress at all on the person (laughs) that's boots on the ground. (laughs) And we just built a really incredible team that were really able to bring the vision to life. Uh It was collaborative. The John George team worked with us. Our owners worked together. I worked together. Our design team. We just really thought through this, the the design in a very thoughtful way. And this time integrating the hotel's history further into the design, the color, the naming. Druzy and Dar was once the Capitol Grill. It's now Druzy and Dar. Two children that lived in the hotel. I love that. That... Yeah, you know, to think through the lens of children, uh-huh. and and I'd say my kids today are the modern version of Druzy and Dar. While oh we my don't gosh, live so here, true. It's like Zach yes. and Cody. Do you remember that show? <laughs> Come on, am I showing my? I'm showing my children's age. You Zach are, and Cody is. They lived in a hotel. It, it was oh, a Disney show. Wait, in New York. In New York. Okay, no, yeah. in Boston. Oh, in Boston. In Boston. Okay. There's, an, sh- there's one now that's age. based in New York that I watch with Oh, <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> Same but different. Anyway. But yeah, your oh, kids really awesome. are because I are. see photos of them. And that's such like a nice. It is. It, that story resonated with all of us. But oh, me that's personally. So cool. Because both personally, professionally, there's such an alignment with what I do. And, and in hospitality, there's courtesy, there's manners, there's there's so much that our industry teaches you that mm-hmm. are lifelong lessons. And my kids love travel. They love food. I try not to go on date nights with them. They're really, it's, it's very expensive. <laughs> they go, no, her... Where was it? The Optimist and her son was like sitting there with all this seafood. Aww. And I was like, oh, my gosh, how fun. I had, I think, a glass and a half of wine. That was it. <laughs> Meanwhile, the food that we had was a dozen oysters to start off with. <laughs> he wanted octopus that day and he wanted a date night with mom because mom works a lot. And, and so I'm like, OK, great. Let's go have dinner. And he said, well, I want octopus. And I said, you do realize we're landlocked. (laughs) (laughs) And so we went, they had it on the menu. And so he gets a dozen oysters on a half shell. He's going through the description. He's loving it. He's like, oh, this is really briny. Oh, this is really, you know, this is like like a true foodie. Yeah. That's and fantastic. we we have our meal and it's it's dessert time and he's can we just get another dozen oysters instead like I, I think we can skip the dessert <laughs> oh like, my okay gosh. well that's fun oh, though you're creating hilarious. little like foodie travelers yeah well that check for an adult and a child was like two hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> oh my god <laughs> I'm not gonna lie John and Bailey did that at the same place <laughs> right and they had a blast but John said the same thing because they do they love their food wow they do. And it's yummy. It's so yummy. Mm -hmm. I love, I I mean, I love, Nashville has some amazing restaurants. It is a pretty town. It was one of the reasons why John George made so much sense to us Uh that, you know, you add now a global culinary, you know, icon to, to Nashville. 
it celebrates Nashville and all that Nashville is doing in terms of just your food scene, your entertainment scene. It's so much more than just what it once was 20 years ago. Wow. It's a place people want to be. I'm sitting here and thinking we need to do a staycation here, John I and I. You yeah. do. I would love that. Oh, I that. thought you meant you and me. Well, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, me and you too. Tell me. That would be great. <laughs> Staycations of fun. What are your like favorite two dishes? I know the dishes probably change, but what are your two favorites right now? Okay. The ahi tuna is divine. Oh gosh. I want to tell you more than two. Okay. Tell me all all of them. The the longevity noodles are phenomenal. I crave them all the time. It's got a pound or so of lobster on top and these noodles and the flavor and the the punch of just all the different flavors that go into it. The crispy sushi is oh, so good. Yum. The warm shrimp salad. It sounds delicious. I've eaten here several times. It's amazing. Everything I've gotten has been incredible. It is good. We are so happy. We've got such a talented culinary team. And just to have a menu that is is a little different, but it's really global. You're, you're getting the flavors of there's European influences, there's Asian influences, there's American influences. I just, I think that that's a menu that really fits into Nashville perfectly today. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, and so that this transformation of the space has been really fun to work with just because you can see the arches and the architecture in here so it's much more than, than than you could have even before the design. The oak bar, which is, you know, 90% of that space is all original in terms of its walls and doors and its ceiling. In fact, there's this little window that's been closed off now for a while, but it used to be the window that women were served cocktails out of because they weren't allowed into the space. Stop. Is that the little round one? Yes. That we, okay, yeah. <gasps> and and then we transformed the ladies' room yes. to the pink. pink. Oh, it's Clark beautiful. Clark had a fit about that. Did she? Pink marble. Yes, it because we filmed here for her. That's right. And that's right. Oh, she loved it. She did. <laughs> she did. <laughs> and then you went to Pink Hermit for oh, yes, yes, we for coffee. coffee and 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 that's just a charm. It's fun. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very. It's fun. just fun. Hermit crab meaning the hermitage. There's this definition again. It's just sort of really deeping deeper into how can we accentuate the uniqueness of this hotel? Yeah. You know, the hotel is Nashville. Mm-hmm. There's, there's nothing like it. You can't build hotels like this anymore. And then we transitioned into the guest rooms and our suites are all fully under construction right now. The rooms are being updated, redesigned, the same palette, the softness. Oh. We're working with local artists to really cultivate art. But then the art has, again, like these moments of messaging in there mm-hmm. where... If you're on the sixth floor where Carrie Chapman Cat stayed, she was the leader of the pro-suffragist. The art theme on that floor will have a moment of yellow in there. Um, But yet the design of the artwork is all consistent, but each floor will have some some element of how it relates to history, particularly in the space that it is. Do you give the guests when they check in, do you give them something about the history so they'll know? Yeah, we do. We do. So the... All the artwork hasn't all come in. Thank you, mm-hmm. COVID and supply chain and all <laughs> the things that come have, mm-hmm. have come from that. But that is in process. And it's just been a fun project to work on. The floor that the children lived on, you know, the artwork will represent suitcases and just little oh, things like that that, again, just connect to the family yeah. or when Minnesota Fats lived in the hotel and he was a pool player. There's a lot of history and a lot yeah. being intertwined. And that leads me to... Our partnership with Draper James, which is a lifestyle retail brand Uh that's owned by Reese Witherspoon. And she's such a champion of women. And she's so inspirational in so many ways. I just, we're so lucky to have just her in Nashville as a gift of inspiration amongst so many other women. Yeah. And and what you're doing. But we had her and her team design a fabric that has been incorporated in basically a uniform program for the, the front of the, the house and the tea service. And so she created this beautiful fabric and this print that again has like a moment of yellow in there that again ties into the history of it's celebrating women. And, and her team were so excited to work on that project that we now have spilling tea with Draper James as mm. part of our tea no way. series. Aww. You would love it. The tea At the hotel. Oh, oh, is it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so good. <laughs> You're the Kathy Lee to my Hoda. <laughs> oh, I love They that. were hilarious when they came in. So they came Did to the hotel come? a few years ago. So Hoda 
and Kathy had to pick three places in Nashville. It was a summer or CMA festival. And so one of the three spots was the men's bathroom. Mm. Of course, the men's bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> 1930s Art Deco. <laughs> and we have cocktails waiting. Hoda was sort of, you know, she waited. <laughs> Kathy was like, hell yeah. <laughs> I love I that. I am your Kathy. I yes. know, Kath. <laughs> yep. Oh Cocktail in hand. And they stood at the urinals and took and the, they, the best photo. That's yes. so With hilarious. their cocktails. I love it. That is well, hilarious. Well, everything you're doing, like your leadership here shows like... I feel like it's so female forward and mm. without you at the helm, that wouldn't be the case. So we just Aww. appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to oh, chat thank with you. us. Thank you. And we know you're a Titans fan. So we Yay. always love that. We love it. I you we dove. I, and so it's excited. female owned. And look at, look at you in terms of just creating a space for women to just share stories and to share their passion. I, Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for doing this. Oh. I've enjoyed listening to the podcast and my kids also get a glimmer of it too because <laughs> each morning I've got this speaker in the bathroom and I connect my podcast or the book that I'm listening to uh -huh. and I put it on the highest like volume <laughs> <laughs> because I could be brushing my teeth. I could be in the shower. I could yeah. be walking. So I need to hear it. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. know, no yeah. matter what or blow driving my hair. And so, yeah, they get to hear a I lot of it. podcasts. I love that. Oh, I know. I, I feel like it, it's very special. And I, we have two female producers, and that's our bread and butter right there. They're the ones that tell yeah. us what to do and believe in us. And um, we think it's been fun. We so love you so much. Guys. Well, thank you so much. Thank and you. We'll definitely see you again soon. I'd love that. <laughs> I feel like I'm a little bored tonight. Take over the city, yeah, baby. Follow my lead, everybody get ready.